Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Shinran, for the amazing intro and for everything that you do for this community, as always. Um, I'm very happy to see a lot of people here, and I'm also very happy that this is not just a live stream, but an actual conversation. So I'll just reiterate what Shinran said. Um, the presentation is definitely not going to take a full hour, and that's on purpose. We really want to try and make it a conversation and see what questions you have and, and just open up the discussion. And I think there's a lot of experience and a lot of opinions in the room, so that would be amazing. Um, for that part later, feel free to enable your cameras if you wish to do so. And um, one last thing, some of you may have attended my um, my my presentation in the London meetup, the data, um, data engineering things London meetup, and that's essentially a replay of that very same presentation. So if you attended that, you will recognize some parts of that. And the idea was to try and share the, the same content with our global community. So if you if you're not from London, welcome and super excited to have you here. Um, if you attended my talk on the Data Science Festival this weekend, some of that will be similar to some of the things I discussed, but not everything. So there will be some overlap. But again, the content is just going to take half the time and then we'll open up for conversation. So this is as live as it gets. Um, so I'll I'll just share, I'll start with the idea of this talk and, and what this is all about. And I think that the, the idea that I had here is that um, growth, unlike the, the perception that a lot of people have that, you know, you just grow linearly over time, growth from my experience, and I'll talk about my experience in a moment, but from my experience is not something that happens over time always, but it's more of in steps. And there are specific moments in your life, in your career, you know, moments in time where something clicks or something becomes clear to you or you realize something that you hadn't realized before, something is hard, 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 and then at some point you're like, okay, I got it, now I know how to do it. So the reality is that growth looks more like a step function rather than just a linear growth function. And what I wanted to do in this talk is essentially share some of my stories of some of some moments that I think were very impactful for my own growth and some big, big aha moments, big learning moments that helped me understand things I hadn't understood before. And I hope that these stories can can inspire you or can help you understand something that took me a long time and maybe I, I understood in the you know in a hard way. And maybe that can accelerate your own growth process. So that is essentially the, the idea behind this talk. So I'll briefly, in terms of the agenda, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'll share some stories. These are literally stories. I mean, I'm 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 just gonna talk through them and then I'm gonna open up for questions. Uh, the drink spot if, is from him, uh, from the meetup. You're welcome to drink if you want to. That's um, that's up to you. So very briefly about myself, just to quickly introduce myself. As I said, my name is Shahar. Uh, I, I I've been in data and leadership for the past twenty years. I started my career in data as a DBA, Oracle nine two zero six, just to date myself if it means anything to anyone. And then I've become a team leader, and since then. I've always been in data and leadership positions uh, throughout my career, both in smaller companies and startups, as well as big tech companies such as PayPal and, and Meta being the last one. At Meta, I was the London data engineering site lead and I've essentially built this function, growing it from four data engineers when I started to more than 200 at the peak. I was managing a small portfolio of products on ads with a run rate of $7 billion a year. And in my last role at Meta, I was the director of data engineering for all of uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger's trust and safety problems. I left uh, Meta in August to start my own company, my own business. So today I'm, a, I'm an advisor, I'm an independent advisor. I just work for myself. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a second. In my spare time, I love spending time with my family. I love cooking and baking, and I also fly airplanes and helicopters recreationally. As a data advisor, what I do is I essentially help people and companies find a path to growth through data. And this is what, what I do. I help companies succeed with their data. I advise to data startups and startups that innovate in the data space specifically. And I also help mentor and grow individuals boosting their careers. I've done that for the past 
20 years and I've helped people grow all the way from intern all to senior executives in big tech companies. So I've got my own playbooks of how to teach, how to grow people. And um, I, I do some of that as well. So that's it about me. Let's talk some stories, right? So the first one is about the work that nobody wants to do. And this was a big aha moment for me when uh, I joined one of the companies I worked for, uh, Pontis, which was a, uh, a company that built a marketing platform for telcos. And um, when I joined Pontis, I was basically interviewing and the CTO really liked me. We had a good uh, connection throughout the interview and he said why don't you just join and we'll figure out something to do with you which was very strange because I wasn't actually joining to do a specific job I just joined the company for whatever so I thought this is really exciting that's a very different way to think about people and to think about you know roles and I, I really like that so I joined the company and I was essentially looking for looking for work right because I didn't I didn't have any job any any role definition or anything like that any responsibilities so I was just going around looking for things to do and all of a sudden I noticed that the marketing teams um had some needed some help from the DBAs to do segmentation which is essentially take all of our you know all of the customers and start segmenting them and ch chopping them into sp smaller groups based on specific criteria and the DBAs absolutely hated that work. They dreaded this work. They never wanted to do it. This is not what they signed up to do. They were not excited about it. So it was it was just not really working. The marketing teams were obviously very frustrated because this was very, very important. They needed somebody to do this work and, and you know, they were not getting the help and support that they needed. So I, I saw that and I realized that this is essentially just data crunching work, right? So I thought maybe that's something I could I could do or something I can help with. And I reached out to the marketing teams and I said, can you, you know, do you, do you mind working with me on that? And they they were absolutely over the moon. It must have been the first time somebody really wanted to work with them and help them. So they were very excited about this proposition. And then I reached out to the DBAs and I said, next time there's a segmentation work, why don't you just show me how you do it and I'll take it from there. Um, which they did, and and um, this became something that I started doing, and I really improved this process, and I added a lot of capabilities. I made it a lot more efficient. I I enabled the marketing teams to segment basically based on whatever they wanted, and not maybe one or two dimensions, um, which is the way it worked earlier. And I think that everyone was really excited about that to the point that my CEO at some point came over and he said, "Listen, Shahar." I don't exactly know what is it that you do. I'm not entirely sure, but we need more people like you because the the work that you do is really, really important for the company and to for us to be able to achieve our goal. So I need you to start hiring people and build your team. And that essentially was the beginning of their analytics team, which I've, I've built. And the lesson here for me was that there's always this kind of work that nobody wants to do. And it can be you know, work that people are not excited about. It can be something that's just feels like a chore or something that's, you know, there's always that kind of work. And this is sometimes one of the biggest opportunities you have. If you take ownership, if you step up and you say, hey, I'm willing to do it, I'm going to take it. And you take that and, and, and improve that process. If the impact is there, it's going to be recognized and it's going to be very, very important for for your for your company and for your business. So that's that was lesson number one, story number one. The second story is about the fact that as data people, we are very close to the data, and that is our superpower. So, so to give an example, um, I was leading a data engineering team on ads at Facebook, and um, we worked on a product that's called FB Lite. FB Lite is essentially a lighter version of Facebook, which can run on older phones, um, you know, less advanced phones, where a lot of the rendering rendering of the page is done on the um, on on the server side and just sent to the client. And it's it's a lighter version that's used a lot in developing countries. And I was in the team that was uh, basically enabling ads on Facebook Lite. And one of my data engineers built a dashboard that was uh, comparing um, different different metrics between Facebook, different ads metrics between Facebook and Facebook Lite. And he, this data engineer built 
build this dashboard comparing all these things. And not only that they build the dashboard, they started drilling down into it because they were very curious, right? And they they built the da dashboard. They wanted to see what it's like and what's in there and just ask some questions and understand the business. So they started playing with it and all of a sudden they noticed something very strange. So for one of the um, ad types, which is multi-image ads, these are ads that have multiple images in them. Um, the revenue of Facebook Lite was something, uh, on Facebook Blue was something you know quite significant and on Facebook Lite was zero. Now, obviously you always expect a Facebook Lite to be lower than Facebook Blue, but zero is a very specific number, right? It just means that there's none. So that obviously uh, raised an alarm with him and, and he started to investigate, started looking into this and try to understand why and debunk that and eventually realized that these types of ads were actually never enabled on Facebook Lite. So they did some quick uh, estimate and assessment together with the data science team and a bunch of other stakeholders. And they realized that this is a multi-million dollar opportunity incremental every year, just, just enabling this and the entire team basically took a project to develop this capability in Facebook Lite and deliver that in the next half, which they did. And uh, this is a, an amazing example of somebody who not only just built the dashboard, which was their day job, but actually showed the extra curios curiosity and took the extra mile to understand what's actually behind it, understand the business, ask a lot of questions. And as a result, they managed to impact the business in a very good way. And the lesson here was that I think a lot of data people and especially a lot of data engineers really underestimate the power of that and, and under underplay the fact that they, they are actually the ones who build the data. They are, the, they are the ones who understand the data and are closest to it. And I think if you can be the person who asks that question, those, sorry, those questions, and you're curious and, and you don't only just deliver data artifacts based on um you you know based on specs but actually spend you know take it the extra mile to understand what's the data for what does the business look like how does it work and you're actually making positive impact the amount of growth it will unlock for you is going to be incredible so that's lesson number two lesson three is own your growth because nobody will do it for you and I think that, first of all, the thing that you, you the, there are basically two things you need to understand here. The first one is that there's only one thing that's constant in your career, and that's you, right? Your managers will change, your teams will change, technologies will change, companies will change. A lot of different things will change, even sometimes industry and people move from one industry to another. And you know, from being a data engineer to being a photographer to being something else. So a lot of things will change throughout your career. And the only thing that will not change is you. And I see a lot of data people, I, I see a lot of people in general, but we're talking about data people here who sort of blame the people around them, their company, their manager, their 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 environment for for not growing. And for not getting opportunities, and for not owning their for 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 not getting to where they want to be, and not achieving their goals. Where the reality is, sometimes it's true, right? And some managers are not as good as others. Some companies are not as good as others. But at the same time, if your manager is not enabling your growth, you're the one suffering from it, not them. And at some point, they will move on to something else, and you're still going to stay there, and it's, you're still not going to be growing. So the only and the best thing you can do is to is to be responsible for your own growth and, and realize that nobody else is going to do it for you. And I remember one of my first managers told me that he, he literally told me, Shahar, every time I get bored, I go to my manager, which, which, which was the CEO of the company, and I tell them, I want to do something else. What else can I do? Or sometimes I come with the idea and I say, hey, I think I'm, I can do this. I see that this area is not working very well. I want to take on an extra responsibility. And here's the trick, right? If you're doing well, if you got your stuff together and your, your team is doing well, your product is doing well, your business is doing well, your data is doing well, whatever you're responsible for is going really well, and you ask for more responsibility, almost always people will be happy to 
to do that for you and to enable you to do that, right? Because companies, you know, naturally want to give people more responsibility. Of course, if you can do more, why not? And so I think that don't wait for somebody to tell you, okay, what's next for you? Don't wait for anybody to tell you, okay, now you have to do this, now you have to do that, but take ownership. Realize that it's your career that's on the line. It's nobody else's career. And if you don't grow, it's going to be your problem and nobody else's. So it's time for you to take ownership, take responsibility, and not wait for anyone to tell you what to do. The next, uh, the fourth point, the fourth story is about relationships. And I, I told that uh, this weekend on the Data Science Festival as well. Um, relationships are crucial for your success in, in companies, unless you work alone and you're the single the single person in your company and you don't have any clients and you just build something and that's it. Relationships are going to be crucial for your success. And when I joined uh, Facebook, when I joined Meta, Vish, uh, Vish Agashi, my first manager, was a VP of data engineering. Uh, we met for our first meeting and he showed me this uh, this book cover, this picture. And he told me, Shahar, you, you basically have three meals a day, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you probably take one or two coffee breaks every day, right? So if you if you take each one of those as an opportunity to, to meet somebody new, to spend time with somebody you'd never met before, somebody you don't know, you'll probably meet close to 2,000 new people every year, which is amazing. And... Um, so I took that that idea. I did read the book, by the way. I don't know what it's about, but I I loved I loved this uh, cover and and I took the idea, and I tried to I tried to meet with a lot of new people throughout my time at Meta. Every opportunity I had to meet a new person and to spend time with somebody I don't know, I would take that. And one particular example was a guy named Dan who reached out to me. They saw my posts on the Facebook, the internal Facebook pilots group which was a group for all the employees who fly. And um, he saw that post and he messaged me and he said, hey, I'm visiting London next week. I thought that it would be nice to catch up. And initially I didn't know who this person is and why are they messaging me, but I thought, okay, that's just another opportunity to meet a new person, so why not? So we met and apparently this guy was a very senior flight instructor in the Bay Area. He's flying airplanes, helicopters, he's flying pretty much everything. It was really, really good. And we connected like that. And obviously we're not working on, on the same products. We had nothing in common in terms of work, but it was an amazing relationship to have. We've become friends. And since then, every time I would go to the Bay Area, I would uh, meet with him, spend time, either go fly with him and, and spend some time flying together, or I would meet him in the office for coffee and we would just chat. And, you know, we just, we, we become very good friends. And then one day, um, one of my peers um, had a problem with the engineering team that they were working with. And they were really struggling with this engineering team because the engineering team was really, uh, had some really severe data quality issues. They were not logging the right data. They were, um, they were not very responsive. The data engineers were asking for a lot of things and really wanted to change and fix the situation. And and the, the engineering team was just not responsive. Things were not really measurable. The data engineer was getting the data engineering team was getting really frustrated to the point that my my peer, they wanted to leave the team. They were just they couldn't handle this anymore because it was such a big mess. And they already started looking for a new job. And 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 then I was in the Bay Area. I had a chat with them. And they told me about this and, and guess who the owner, who, who was the engineering manager for that team? It was Dan, my friend. And Dan and I were going at that time a long way back, but we, we you, you know, we never talk about work. So in I, I, I literally had a meeting with him the next day and I spoke with him and I said, Dan, I just heard about this thing. Your, your engineering team is, is messing things up with the data. Why are they doing this? And he was really surprised by that. He said, oh, really? I didn't know about any of it. Let me see what I can do. And he basically went on and fixed it. So the lesson here is that, first of all, it's a lot of that is about relationships. And secondly, it's the relationships that you will least expect sometimes will be the most crucial for the success in your career. And I think looking back at my own career, some of my biggest achievements were not through 
necessarily talent or hard work was just the fact that I knew the right people at the right time and I had the right connections and I could facilitate things and I could make things happen. And without those relationships, I wouldn't be able to do it no matter how talented I would be or no matter, you know, how much, how hard I would work. So relationships are crucial for the success of ed anyone's career. And again, spend time meeting people. By the way, um, I know that some people are introverted. They don't, the, 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 the idea of just spending time with a random person they'd never met before um, sounds extremely uncomfortable to them. And that's perfectly fine. I, I, I can really understand that. There are way, different ways you can build relationships. First of all, you don't have to start with meeting five new people every day. You can start with one or two people a week. That's that's in itself a very good start. Um, you can there are some ways you can go about it, like prepare interview questions in advance or thing in advance or things that you want to know about people that you meet. So so you already have some structure for the meeting. Uh, you can go to the meeting with another friend or with somebody else. Uh, that that will just help make it a little bit more comfortable. And I think if you if you keep practicing it, and if you keep doing it, I, I guarantee that you will get better over time. I'm sure about that. Uh, the next point is about uh, promotions. Again, this is another thing I talked about on the Data Science Festival more in a high level, but most companies beyond a certain size will have a structured process for promotions. And usually the way these things work is that your manager or somebody needs to put you up for promotion and say, okay, I think that this person is now ready to, to get promoted and they operate at the next level. Usually it ties to some set of expectations that are predefined. You know, you should know what they are and you should be meeting them to get promoted. And I think that at my time at Meta, especially at Meta, but in other companies as well, what I've noticed again and again is that so many people just don't understand what the promotions process look like and how these decisions are made. And not only that they don't know or not understand, but they also made a lot, make a lot of assumptions about what is important and what is not important. And this is just leading to people basically making wrong decisions, spending time on the wrong things, uh, doing you know doing things that they're not supposed to do or not doing some of the things that they are supposed to do because they try to optimize their promotion process they really don't understand and i i've had conversations about these things with my team members over and over again just trying to explain the process to explain what is important and so on but there are some things you can do about it you don't have to leave it to chance so the first thing is just talk to your manager right make sure you understand the expectations, make sure you know what does it mean for you to be operating at the next level. You can talk to them about your plans and about the things you do and ask them, is that, do you think that's, that's, those are the right things to do? Is there anything that is missing? Is there anything that I'm not doing? So asking a lot of those questions is going to be very important. It will really, really help you uh, to know if you're heading in the right path and you just you you don't just guess and wait, but you're actually taking steps to ensure that you're heading in the right path. The second thing is that you can talk to your manager openly about this process and ask them to share information, like how does it actually work? Who is going to be sitting in the room? Who makes the decision? Who is Who is not going to make the decision, but is involved in the process and have an opinion about that? Now, this is actually very, very common because Usually, it's not just your your manager making a decision to promote you and then the next day you get promoted, but there's usually a group or a committee or there's several people sitting in the room and a lot of some of your stakeholders. It can be some of your senior leadership who will make the decision and so on. And while they're not always the ones who recommend the promotion or have the final say on it, they can have an opinion about that, right? And in a lot of cases, people would come to me and ask me about members of the team, their teams, they want to get promoted and ask me, are you supportive of that? Do you think that's this person is ready? Do you have any concerns with them getting promoted? And as a manager, I, I had to do the same thing, right? I had to, whenever I put somebody up for promotion, I don't want any surprises. I don't want to get in the room and find out that there's a lot of rejection and actually a lot of the stakeholders don't agree with this promotion um, or especially key people. 
So I would go and have the conversation with them first to make sure that we're on the same page, we're aligned, listen to their concerns. And the point here is that there are a lot of people who are not necessarily your managers. They may not be your leaders, but they have a lot of influence about your uh, on, on your promotion and your ability to get promoted. And the best thing you can do is try to understand who these people are and make sure that you know you build the right relationship with them that they they are aware of the work that you do they are aware of the impact of your work and so on i've i've been getting a lot of questions even from my leadership when i've put up somebody for promotion and uh, i would i would recommend this person to be promoted and my my manager or my skip level manager would say i don't know anything about this person's work which is not a very good starting point for a promotion discussion so if you can preempt those things by for yourself by just making sure that the relevant people at least are aware of your work and again going back to um introversion and also some people just don't feel like it's appropriate to self promote or don't know how to do it and these kind of things so i can the, the one thing i can say is it's not about self promotion it's just about increasing awareness of something that you did that helped the company, that helped the business. It's not to, you know, tap on your own shoulder and things like that. It's really about making sure that people are aware of good work that has happened. And I don't think there's any shame in that. I don't think there's anything bad about it. There are elegant ways of doing it, which can help you and help you progress in your career. So take that into account and really just understand the, the, the process what is the process? How does it work? How do these conversations happen? Who are the people, the relevant people who make the decision and try to approach them before, uh, uh, way before this is becoming an issue? And also what are the expectations and what is expected of you as a person? If you don't know what is expected for you, of you to get promoted, then that's a very good conversation for you to have with your manager. The next point is about the importance of saying no. And to be honest, and, and this is going to be very surprising, uh, I think that the ability to say no is actually one of the most important skills for, for people and one of the things that's really slowing people's growth down, especially for senior level. The more senior you are, uh, the more experienced you are, the, the higher your level is in the company, the more people who need something from you, the, the the bigger the expectations are and the ability to manage those expectations and the ability to say, okay, we're not going to do this or this is not possible is really, really important. And this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, and that's something I've been mentoring people and teaching people over the years over and over again, because when, when you overpromise and under deliver, when you say you're going to be doing something and then you end up not doing it or doing it in a way that's not satisfactory, that's actually worse than saying, I'm not going to be able to do it. And one of the best examples I've had for that is when uh, when we moved to the UK, me and my family, when we moved to the UK, we used to live, the, live in Oxford where my wife was doing her PhD. And one one evening we uh, we met, it was in January, it was super cold outside and we'd uh, scheduled with a bunch of friends to go to a formal dinner in Oxford. Now, for those who don't know, formal dinners are actually a very big event in Oxford where you go to a college and it looks like Harry Potter with all the big long tables and a bunch of students sitting there and there's a blessing in the beginning and there's a whole ceremony. And um, it's, it's a very um, official event uh, and you really have to be there on time. And we told our friends that the, the, the dinner was supposed to start at 7.30. So we agreed to meet there at 7, um, walk around the college, have some time, and then get seated before we start. So I called the taxi companies at 6 to get a company, to, to get a taxi from our house, which was probably about 20 minutes from the college or 15 or 20 minutes to get a taxi so we can get there at 7. I, I called a bunch of companies. Again, it was super cold day, minus 2 degrees outside. It was freezing, and and because of that, I guess a lot of the, the the taxi companies were just super busy. So I called one company, and they said, "Oh, I'm sorry, we don't have a taxi for you." And I called another one, and again, I get rejected. Again, I get rejected, rejected, until like the fourth or fifth company, they say, "Yeah, no problem. We'll send the taxi over to you at uh, six forty-five as you requested. No problem." 
So we stand outside in the cold at 6.45, me and my wife and our friend, and we wait for the taxi and we keep waiting and waiting and the taxi just doesn't arrive. And 6.50, I call the taxi company again and I say, hey, what's going on? Is this is this taxi arriving? And they said, no, it's not. Uh, yes, it's coming. It's literally around the corner. Don't worry, it's coming. So I said, okay, fine. Uh, wait for another five minutes. Five minutes to seven, we call them again. And I say, hey, what's going on? You said the taxi is around the corner. It still hasn't arrived. Are you sure? And they said, yes, yes, of course. Why do you keep calling us? And I said, dude, I called you at six because I wanted to make sure the taxi is going to be there on time. It's a formal event. We 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 cannot be late. And the taxi is still not here. And now I'm getting anxious. And they said, dude, it's literally around the corner. Don't worry. Just wait there where you are. We keep waiting. It's already seven. I'm getting a little bit more anxious. We call them again. It was becoming very clear that they don't have a taxi driver. There's nobody coming. Uh, this time uh, I used more colorful language, uh, so to speak, and and told them exactly what I think about them and about their service and their their company. And they, in return, told me, okay, right now we're not going to send you any taxi. Even if we had that, we're not going to send you anything. And this was just a really nasty situation. I kept making phone calls. Eventually, we managed to get there just on time. It was terrible. But guess what? I called four or five different companies and all of them said no. And it was disappointing. Honestly, like it's really disappointing to call a taxi company and they say, no, we can't help you. But I I wasn't upset with them, right? Because the, the company I was really upset with is not the one who said, we can't help you, but the company that said, yes, no worry, we're going to send a taxi and lied about the whole thing or didn't have the, the the capacity to support me. And I'm pretty sure they had a driver. It was just in another part of town and they just couldn't make it on time. But instead of telling me this and being honest about it and saying, look, we, we can't get you there on time. If you want, you can talk to somebody else. They tried to say to, to save the business by trying to keep keep me waiting while they tried to figure it out. And that's really aggregate aggravated things and made everything worse. And you know, guess what I did after this uh, whole thing? I, I just made made a point to give them a terrible review in every possible platform. So nobody else would use them. My friend would give them a review. I'd never call them again. And so it's not it's not the people who say no that I have the problem with, but the people who say yes and then don't deliver. And the mistake that a lot of data people make and a lot of data engineers in particular is just to say yes to everything because they don't want to disappoint anyone and they don't want to let anyone down. So they say yes to a bunch of things and then either they get super stretched and super stressed because they have so much work and they just cannot keep up with it or they uh, they just uh, start, you know, balls start falling and, and the work is not happening and then the stakeholders are even less happy. So learn how to say no. It's probably one of the biggest life-changing um, things that you will do, life-changing skills that you will acquire in your career. If you don't know how to do that, get help. Ask your manager, ask your stakeholders and, and get help. And there are a lot of really good ways to learn how to do that, but it's really, really important. Couple of last points, and then we can move to the Q&A. Um, one is looking at the big picture. And I think I share that story in the data science festival as well, but um, I was working in ads on a product that's called Product Catalog. And Product Catalog is, is essentially a way to share, a way for advertiser with a bunch of products, with a lot of products, to share their catalog with Facebook so that they can create, um, dynam so they can dynamically create ads on Facebook without having to create all of them one by one. To give an example, Amazon is an advertiser that probably has billions of different products that they want to advertise. And instead of having to create billions of ads, what they do is just send Facebook the entire catalog. And then they use that to dynamically create ads to the right people based on products that would be relevant to them. So one of my team members started working on product catalog and um, they there are two ways you can create catalog. The first one is uh, through the user interface, through the UI where you upload like a CSV or Excel file or something with uh, with the list of products, with the list of items that you have. This is good for small merchants, maybe like a chocolate shop or something like that, that doesn't have 
a lot of products. And the other one is through the API where you just upload, like bulk upload uh, a large number of uh, items. And my data, my data engineer basically uh, started working with this team. And the first thing they wanted to do is to just experiment with the product catalog and see what it looks like. So they tried to create a small catalog on the UI and it didn't work. It kept, it kept failing. It kept giving weird error messages. It wasn't clear what's not working. The, it was all, the whole experience was really clunky and slow. And they basically started reporting a lot of bugs to the software engineers and the software engineers were not doing anything about that. So my my data engineer basically reached out and say, hey, people, like I'm reporting all these bugs. Why are you not doing anything about it? And the engineer said, oh, because the UI is low priority for us. And the the my my data engineer just couldn't understand that because why why would the way to create a catalog would be low priority? Of course, it's important. And not until they looked at the team's dashboards, they came they came over to me and said, look, I'm really worried about this team. And I said, oh, why are you worried? And they said, because they're optimizing for the wrong things. And I said, okay, tell me more. And they said, because, you know, I, I, I tried to, they described the whole experience with creating catalogs on the UI and the team doesn't care about that. And, and he said, I couldn't understand why they don't care about that until I looked at their top line dashboard and their goal for the half is number of items in catalog, right? And there's a specific number they need to hit. And obviously if that's your top line goal, and if that's the thing that you're trying to optimize for, you don't really care about small advertisers. You only cares, care about the Amazons and Shopify's of the world. And because of that, you only care literally about like a hundred or 200 advertisers. And all of them just use the, the, the API. So of course the UI is not gonna be a priority. And I said, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And he also said, look, I know that he, we care a lot about small advertisers. And I know that this team is frustrated that they're being undervalued. And I think that's the reason. And I said, okay, great. What are you going to do about that? And he said, I actually spoke with the data scientist and product manager and engineering manager already. And it, it was very close to the end of the half. And they said, I proposed uh, a, different, a different goal that basically takes into account the number of items, but also number of advertisers. Maybe it's like number of advertisers, uh, number of items divided by number of advertisers or something like that, which basically uh, will change the team's focus to focus on the right things. And they did, and their entire roadmap for the following half looked very different because now what they're trying to do or what they're trying to solve for is not just number of items. So look at the big picture. Sometimes you have to take a step back and you have to think, okay, why are things happening in the way they do? Why is this person telling me this? Or why is this team doing that? And try to be curious and ask those questions. And I think that it will help you understand things uh, in, in, a bit of, in a better way. It will give you perspective, which will in turn help you um, be more impactful and, and help your teams and your companies. And the last point uh, for today is that growing isn't just about learning. It's also about the ability to unlearn things. And uh, I think that that's something that is very counterintuitive for a lot of people, especially when you grow. Um, I went, The story here is that I went to, um, before I had my helicopter pilot license, I went to a flight school in the Bay Area. And I was talking to the owner, they teach both airplanes and helicopters. And I was speaking with the owner of the school and I asked them if I have an, if I have an uh, airplane license, pi private pilot license, will that help me get a helicopter license? And I, I remember this guy actually laughing in my face. He was literally laughing and he said, oh no, actually, um, if you have an airplane license, pilot license, if you fly airplanes, there are a few things you need to unlearn to be able to fly helicopters and vice versa, because your instincts as an airplane pilot can get you killed as a helicopter pilot and, and the other way around. Like some of your instincts are not gonna work and you really have to unlearn a few things to make space for something else. And they, this, was, this was very interesting. I never thought about that, but 
actually when you grow, for example, if you start as an individual contributor and then you become a manager of a small team, some of the things that helped you as an IC are not going to help you anymore as a manager, right? Some of the things that made you really, really successful as an IC are now going to be, uh, you know, go, going to contradict your growth as a manager. And when you manage, when you're a manager for five people's team and now you become a manager of a 50 people organization, that's again a different skill set. And if you're going to try and do the same things in the same way, it's not going to work. At some point, you have to unlearn. It's the same thing uh, if you're, you know, just starting in the beginning of your career as data engineer, or you want to get promoted to to senior data engineer staff, data engineer principal, data engineers. Each one of those growth moments or these promotions are going to require to let go of some of the things you used to do in the past and, and make room for new ways of working, new ways of doing things. And if you don't know how to unlearn, if you don't know how to let go of these things, you will really, really struggle to be successful and, and your growth will be very capped. So just to quickly summarize uh, some of these points, uh, the work that nobody wants to do, remember sometimes it's a huge opportunity, look around, see what people don't want to do and ask yourself, is that important for the company? And if that's the reason, if, if the answer is yes, then why do people not want to do it and see if that's an opportunity for you? Uh, being close to the data is a superpower. Be curious, ask a lot of questions. Don't just deliver artifacts because people ask you to, but take take the, the, take the extra step um, in making sure that you really know what you're doing. Uh, own your growth. Nobody's going to do it for you. Uh, it's all about the relationships and be intentional about that. Be proactive about that and create relationships even with people you have no idea why you're spending time with them. It will become very important for your growth in the future. Understand the promotion process for your for your company. Understand how these things work. Learn how to say no. It's honestly one of the most life changing skill for every uh, every professional in our in our industry. Just learn how to do that and get really good at that. Look at the big pictures, take a step back, ask a lot of questions, be curious, try to understand why things happen in the way they do. And finally, make sure that not only that you're learning, but you're also you also know when you need to unlearn to make room for for new skills, new ways of doing things. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn. We'll open up for the q and I guess, Shinran, but um, really appreciate your time and thank you for investing in yourself.